we've assembled a panel of experts to delve into this topic. John Atwood, the director of bird conservation for Mass Audubon, has been a practicing ornithologist and conservation biologist for 30 years. His specialty is the integration of behavioral studies of rare and endangered bird species with habitat conservation planning. Sarah Grady, who serves as watershed ecologist for the North and South Rivers Watershed Association, among other jobs she has, received her PhD in biology from the Boston University Marine Program at Woods Hole in 2006. Her specialties include coastal and estuarian ecology, invertebrate zoology, and ecological restoration. And Zach Mertz, who grew up in Hingham and recently joined the board of the Land Trust. He has a master's degree in environmental science from UMass. He is executive director of the Cape Wildlife Center and assistant director of the New England Wildlife Center. So that's our panel. But before we begin with the panel, here's a quick overview of what we mean when we use the term climate change. First, it's important to remember that climate is not the same as weather. When we discuss climate, we are looking at multi-year regional patterns, not the atmospheric conditions on a given day in Hingham or elsewhere. There are several indicators of climate change around the world. The data that I will cite here comes primarily from NASA, and there's a website, climate.nasa.gov, which has a lot of good information. Temperatures are rising, 1.62 degrees since the late 19th century, and 18 of the 19 warmest years have occurred since 2001. The ocean is warming. The top 700 meters of the ocean by depth have warmed more than 0.4 degrees since 1969. Glacial ice sheets are shrinking. From 1993 to, 20, to 2016, Greenland lost 286 billion tons of ice per year, and Antarctica lost 127 billions of billion tons per year. The rate of Antarctica ice mass loss tripled in the last decade. There is decreased snow cover, which the skiers in our audience have likely anticipated firsthand in the past decade or two. Sea level is rising by eight inches in the last century. The rate of sea level rise has doubled in the last two decades, something of particular concern for coastal communities like Hingham and coastal cities like Boston. We have more frequent extreme weather events, and ocean acidification has increased by 30% since the late 1700s. Why is this happening? Well, there's a general warming effect over time from the sun's heat, some of which is absorbed by the Earth's surface, some of which is absorbed uh, by greenhouse gases and then radiated back to the Earth's surface. This is called solar irradiance. Measurements show that since 1750, energy from the sun has remained constant. And since 1978, solar irradiance has dropped slightly. So scientists have determined that recent changes in temperature are too large to be caused by solar activity. Although subtle changes in the Earth's orbit are judged to be responsible for the comings and goings of ice ages, scientists have also determined that the accelerated warming the Earth has experienced over re recent decades is also too large to be linked to the Earth's orbit. Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, nitrous oxides, methane, and ozone are trace gases that account for about one-tenth of the Earth's atmosphere. These gases and carbon dioxide in particular which accounts for almost 94% of the greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, are considered the likely cause of climate change. Some facts about carbon dioxide. It's released into the atmosphere in a variety of ways, as shown here on this slide. And since the beginning of the industrial era, carbon dioxide concentrations have increased substantially. Almost all of this is due to human activities. Other greenhouse gases are a much smaller part of the atmosphere, and they have seen only modest increases over this period. In its fifth assessment report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a group of 1,300 independent scientific experts from around the world, 
working under the auspices of the United Nations, concluded that there is a more than 95% probability that the industrial activities of our modern civilization have raised atmospheric carbon dioxide levels in the last 150 years from 280 parts per million to 400 parts per million. This group concludes that human-produced greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, as well as methane and nitrous oxide have caused, have caused much of the observed increase in the Earth's temperature over the past 50 years. So that's what we mean by climate change, what it is, why it's happening. Our panelists tonight, though, will focus our attention on the observed impact of climate change on the natural world around us. Each panelist has some prepared remarks, and I remind you to jot down any questions you have from any of the speakers, because we'll wait until the end to deal with questions and answers. There are cards on the table over there if you didn't get a card, and there are pens as well. So help yourself, and we will moderate the discussion um, at the end. Now I'll turn this over to Sarah Grady, who'll be our first panelist. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, so I am the South Shore Regional Coordinator for the Massachusetts Bay's National Estuary Program, which is one of 28 national estuary programs around the country. And um, if you're looking closely at the map, you'll notice uh, my region is the pink region. It includes nine communities from Cohasset south to Plymouth, and Hingham is not actually one of my communities. You're in the Mass Bay's Metro Boston region. Uh, your coordinator is Tori Hanley, who's uh, up at Northeastern's Marine Science Center. Um, but my role uh, in these communities is pretty much to help them with whatever coastal issues they may have. So I do monitoring, I do restoration projects, and I do outreach events like this. So the main climate change impacts uh, that I'm gonna be talking about briefly tonight um, span the entire range of the estuary from the headwaters all the way down to where our rivers meet the salt water from the ocean and just off the coast. So if you're kind of working your way from fresh to salt, um, the first thing I'm gonna briefly touch on is how temperature and precipitation changes affect stream flow and fish passage in our streams. Um, and we'll work our way down to the salt marshes and talk about briefly about how sea level rise impacts those. And then finally, offshore um, and in our um, more marine uh, bays, how coastal acidification affects shellfish. So um, there are a couple of different uh, impacts of climate change that can have a direct or a secondary effect on uh, fish passage and stream flow. So um, river herring, um, many of you maybe have been going out um, and seeing the river herring. Uh, they're running right now. Very strong year, actually, for the herring this year. Um, and the life cycle of the river herring is that it lives in the ocean for about four years before it reaches maturity, swims up into freshwater streams, uh, lays its eggs. The adult herring go back out to the ocean. Those eggs hatch out after about a couple of weeks, and then at the end of the summer and through the fall, the juvenile herring migrate out. The way that river herring cue into when it's time to come up into our rivers is by temperature. So as we see warming water, we would likely see fish coming into our streams earlier, which we have already started to see. We um, used to really predict that we would start our, our herring counts uh, in April. Now we really get going probably by the end of March. Um, we also see that um, precipitation has an effect on how the fish are able to get in, but more importantly, how the fish are able to get out of our streams. So um, usually our spring stream flow is pretty adequate to get those adult fish up to the spawning grounds. The issue we really have is when um, we have the natural lower flows that we get at the end of the summer and the beginning of the fall, compounded by uh, lower precipitation in the summer, as well as um, more excess water use, which is often driven by higher temperatures. Um, and then that leads to low stream flow um, in our streams. And even if we were able to have a great herring run in the spring, 
the juvenile fish can't really get out. Um, so some of the losses that we've had in our, in our herring runs have been more due to an inability for the fish to get out than for them to get in. Um, so as we move down, um, as sea level is rising, it will, uh, it has already been, um, affect the zonation in our salt marshes. So the um, primary uh, grasses that live in a salt marsh are two species of Spartina. Um, there's a low marsh grass called Spartina alterniflora, which is cord grass. And then there's um, a high marsh grass, salt marsh hay, uh, which is Spartina patens. And those define the low and the high marsh, respectively. And then we have upland plants as well, um, usually um, high tide bush, like Iva, it's called Iva frutescence. So as we see greater uh, duration of salt water sitting on our marshes, um, and we see higher high tides due to sea level rise. Um, we start seeing places that are now upland shifting into salt marsh. We see places that are high marsh changing into low marsh. And um, in rivers that are mostly undammed, um, we also start my daughter Molly, we also start to see a shift potentially from brackish marsh to salt marsh. So for example, the North River um, is 13 miles to the first dam and it has tidal freshwater marsh. We anticipate that as the sea level rises, we're going to start seeing migration of the salt marsh up the um, estuarine corridor. And finally, um, the last issue um, is coastal acidification. So um, Carbon dioxide, as was mentioned, uh, does get absorbed into uh, the water, and there it reacts with the water to create something called carbonic acid, which is an acid. Um, and if you uh, know what acid does to calcium carbonate, which is what's in the shells of shellfish, um, you know that it, it weakens it and it dissolves it. Um, so our shellfish, our clams and our oysters um, in particular, um, are vulnerable to that um, change in pH. And um, it's, they're especially vulnerable when they're small. So when they're spat, their shells are very thin. Um, so that's really when it's affecting them. Uh, my name is John Atwood, and I'm the director of bird conservation at Massachusetts Audubon Society. Uh, headquartered in Lincoln. Uh, many of you are familiar with Mass Audubon through one of its uh, approximately 100 different sanctuaries scattered across the state. Uh, there's also a headquarters to all those 100 odd sanctuaries, and I work at that headquarters uh, office in Lincoln. And we do a lot of different things, and the, the work that I'm going to talk about here tonight is, is certainly one of the primary foci of our activities these days having to do with climate change. Um, and what I want to do is kind of set the stage for what I hope will be a good conversation after our panel discussion. Um, just by kind of hitting on a few of the different ways that we anticipate seeing bird populations change um, as a result of climate change. Um, most of you are probably familiar with the idea that we anticipate a lot of birds to shift, to, to be shifting their distributions um, as a result of warming temperatures and changes in precipitation patterns. Um, this map here shows uh, a, a predictive model of where this bird that some of you probably recognize, a hermit thrush, they're back from wherever they spent the winter and they're in your backyards probably right now. Um, hermit thrushes right now um, are pretty widely distributed, as you see in those orange and warm areas of, of New England. Um, in about the year 2050, the models that we've created based on, on, habit, on uh, climate predictions, the distribution of hermit thrushes will look something like this. 
okay? A dramatic shift northwards, and in fact, let me back up just for a second, try to back up anyway. Maybe I can't back up, there we go. Look at Massachusetts in particular, right now pretty much in terms of the climate envelope, hermit thrushes think this is a great place to live, but by 2050, maybe not quite so so good. So we're gonna see some pretty profound changes and we've, we've produced a, a, a document that we call State of the Birds and you can go to our website and download PDF copies of this document, and it's a pretty good primer of some of the different effects of, of uh, climate change that we anticipate with bird populations. But I wanted to back up even a little bit before this and talk about some of the things that, that Sarah mentioned, or Eileen, Eileen? <laughs> uh, mentioned, um, having to do with broad changes in temperature. This is a diagram uh, that kind of shows in black the average summer tem temperatures during the period 1960 to 1999. Uh, by the current condition, the average summer temperatures of Massachusetts feel kind of like it used to feel in uh, that area of southern New York and Long Island. So it's already warmed up some. And then there's a couple of indications of what the temperatures are likely to be like in our area by 2070 uh, and 2099. And these, the yellow and red uh, blobs there sort of indicate predictions based on a really optimistic scenario of people cutting back on greenhouse gases and a less optimistic scenario. Okay, so if people really pay attention to the Paris Accords, for instance, by 2070 to 2099, Massachusetts will feel like it currently feels in southern New Jersey. Okay, but if we don't do that kind of dr dramatic change by 2070 or 2099, under a higher emissions scenario, it'll feel more like South Carolina. Now, personally, I think if I had to live in South Carolina, I hate humidity and I hate heat. Might as well just shoot me right off the bat. There's also extreme increases, increased uh, extreme precipitation events. So between 1958 to 2012 in the Northeast, there was a 71% increase in precipitation that fell during, quote, very heavy events. So the pattern of precipitation is really changing. And as, as uh, Sarah mentioned, uh, there will be increased sea level. So if you look at this map, again, a prediction that are areas that would be flooded with six feet of sea level rise, which is a fairly plausible amount by the year 2100, the blue areas on that map, this is Boston, uh, are gonna be underwater and the low-lying areas are gonna be those areas shown in green. So those are gonna be influenced a lot. And that's kind of a problem. Who knows what this is? That's Logan Airport, right? It's kind of a problem there. Um, you know, here's Boston University, kind of becomes an island. Um, you know, downtown Boston Common right here surrounded by water. So really profound changes as a result of sea level rise. But what I wanna talk about are bird effects, all right? And I'm just gonna hit two because I promised Zach I wouldn't go on and on and on. <laughs> um, one has to do with timing changes of when eggs are laid and when prey is available to those nesting birds. The other has to do with availability of nesting habitat. So this is a map showing the results of studies of phenological changes in plants. And plants, of course, form the prey base because that's what the insects eat, and the insects, you know, are what the birds eat. All these red areas here are places where spring leaf out occurred about three weeks earlier compared to 2012, okay? So you can see it's sort of spotty. There's also places 
where leaf out occurred later than it did. And so what, you say? What difference does it make? Well, here's what difference it makes. And this is work that's based on studies done in Europe, but the same idea is true here in the US. Uh, great tits are kind of the European version of our black-capped chickadees. And under good normal conditions, eggs get laid in this time period. And then about this period later, all the caterpillars are out. And that's right at the time when there's baby birds in the nest and the tits need to have food to be able to feed. And that's good. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's evolved over millennia. However, with this really rapid change, what's happened is the caterpillar hatch is shifted to the right. So the nesting activity starts at the same time period as previously because it's driven by daylight, things like that, that aren't really changing. So it stays in here, the baby birds all hatch, and then a few days later or a couple weeks later, the caterpillars are all available. So that means there's a, di a mismatch that prevents food to be available um, at the time that the birds need it. And then finally, availability of nesting habitat. I th thought I'd show some pictures of some local critters that you know about piping plovers. You probably know about least terns. Uh, these are birds that nest in the upper portion of the barrier beaches. And those portions of the barrier beaches are going to get impacted more and more by rising sea levels. And this is kind of the poster child here of that problem. You may not know it. It's kind of a little obscure brown sparrow called a salt marsh sparrow. And I'd be surprised if any of you have seen salt marsh sparrows, because you've got to go to exactly the right spot in order to find salt marsh sparrows. They put their nests in marshes that when the tide rises, those nests literally slide up the the support structures of the reeds that they're built on. And then the tide goes out and the nest slides back down. This is the way this has worked. For tens of thousands of years, salt marsh sparrows have lived in this tidal zone. Well, now the tidal fluctuation is too great, okay? And so this bird, salt marsh sparrows, which live pretty much entirely from southern Maine down to Virginia, this is probably a bird that in 50 years, it's going to go extinct. Okay, The whole range is going to be too unsuitable. And that's, you know, that's a really tragic thing. And it's tragic because, and uh, the one thing that I might add to the, the great information that Eileen gave is that if we were to have a miracle tonight, and tomorrow morning, the world human population would wake up and say, we're not going to put any more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Tomorrow morning, we're going to wake up. There's not going to be any greenhouse gas pollution. The tragic part is that there's enough up there all right now that for the next 50 or 100 years, these changes are going to happen even if that miracle happens. Hmm. That's a scary proposition, and it means we've got to think in terms of two different levels. One is how do we stop making the problem worse, and how do we adapt to the reality that climate change is real and it's happening? My name is Zach Mertz. I'm the executive director of the Cape Wildlife Center and the assistant director of the New England Wildlife Center, which is based more locally over in Weymouth. Um, we are wildlife veterinary hospitals, and we are education and research organizations. So each year, we treat about 230 different species of wildlife that come to us for, with illnesses and afflictions ranging from hit by car to flooded out of their home, disturbed from torpor, and increasingly, the patient dri or the drivers of patient admissions um, are becoming more and more weather-based and as such more and more climate-based. 
So I should say quickly, the New England Wildlife Center has been in existence for about 30 years. So we have 30 years worth of local wildlife patient admission data, and I have several years of data from the Cape too. So I'm going to talk to you about today, there is a, we there is a difference between weather and climate. Um, climate being the aggregate of long-term weather patterns. Um, but what we see on the front lines of wildlife care is often driven by things that we've talked about and other panelists have discussed, um, extreme weather events, um, population shifts, habitat shifts, and then all of the associated impacts with that. Okay, so the first one, seasonal variations in population cycles. I am thrilled that it's nice outside. It's been beautiful all week. Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but you'll hear um, the birds chirping um, and wildlife is as active and busy as we are these days. This is absolutely our busiest season. Um, we have like 125 patients in our hospital right now. Um, most of them are young. And so for as long as anyone in the field can remember, um, each year, the cycles of different species come in a pretty regular fashion, right? So in the world of wildlife rehab, we often um, judge our timing by squirrels, which is a strange thing, but it's pretty familiar to us. Um, and for, you know, 25, 30 years, you could almost predict to the day you would get your first baby squirrel admission. Okay, it was almost St. Patrick's Day. In fact, we even hold the lottery every year and guess, and I would always win because it was always there. Um, but what I will say is over the last seven, eight years, things have become a little less predictable and never more so than this year, right? So we had a really warm year. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this either, but there are a ton of uh, turkeys around and deer around. Um, it has a lot to do with the bumper crop of acorns that have popped up, probably driving the squirrel admissions too. And so at the end of the summer, you know, late October, you'll get your last batch of squirrels. And then usually March, you know, 15th to 17th, you'll get your first batch. So where you used to have this eight week stretch, we're now seeing something like a three week stretch, right? And so I can't tie this directly to climate change, but I can tie it to weather patterns that we're seeing that seem to be elongating um, as we go forward. And so that sounds nice. You have more squirrels. They're very cute. They're harmless. Um, but we are seeing impacts in that a lot of the squirrels we're, we're getting coming in and not only squirrels, but other animals mom has had an extra litter. It's not that she's spreading out the time, she's actually having more and more babies, which are extremely resource intensive. So we're seeing this huge spike in animals um, with congenital birth defects like cataracts, um, neurological problems. And so we're really seeing it firsthand what this elongated season means. Um, and then also, of course, with extreme weather, it can get cold very quickly. <laughs> it can have an episodic rain event very quickly. And so these, these young ones are running into quite a few other problems as well. Um, and of course, this fuels larger population trends. You know, this year the acorns go up, next year the squirrels, turkeys, and deer go up, the year after that predators go up, and we have these sort of boom and bust cycles. Um, but as we go into the future, things are becoming less predictable. And um, I can't say for sure what that's gonna do, but we do know it's gonna change some things. Um, so extreme weather. Every animal up here I put on um, because it was a recent patient admission, meaning from the winter forward, that was extreme weather related, right? So when you think of extreme weather, everybody thinks of like, you know, a massive snowstorm or a huge rain event. Um, for us, it can also be a cold snap, right? So do anybody remember Thanksgiving this year where it was like nine degrees or something like that? It was freezing cold. Um, but a few days before that, it had been warm. In fact, it was so warm that this, this snake woke up um, from his winter uh, brumation. And the weather was warm enough and all of a sudden it got cold so quickly, he was actually out on an ice, he was out on a pond and he froze to the ice. He came in in a frozen block of ice. Um, likewise, these bats are waking up from brumation. Um, we have about 15 bats in the hospital. Um, in addition to white nose fungus, and you guys may have heard about, um, one of the most acute and common reasons we get these guys in is because um, they wake up, there's no mosquitoes when they wake up midwinter, you know, we get a couple couple mild days, they start to fly around, all of a sudden there's no food source, they become weakened, can't find a spot to be safe, and then all of a sudden another cold snap comes and they get hypothermia quite easily. Um, turtles as well, um, that's a diamondback terrapin. Um, we also have about 20 of those, I think now, that are, have been cold stunned. Um, and lastly, those are gannets. Um, 
extreme weather does come in the form of, especially down here in nor'easters. Anytime there is a nor'easter or a hurricane, you can almost guarantee our hospital will fill up with seabirds of all different types. Um, this one weekend, uh, we did get about 50 gannets at once. And if you've ever seen a gannet, they're large diving birds, and they're not particularly nice. Trying to house and rehabilitate uh, 50 at once is a challenge. And now if that happened once a year, we could probably deal with it. But as these storms become more frequent and more intense, um, not only does it make our lives harder, but it really changes. Um, you start to see a change in the population numbers and survival rates. OK. Um, so I think our other panelists summed it up really well. We're seeing a change in habitat. We're seeing a change in population um, in ecology. and. What that means is we also see changes in disease processes, right? So not only are there new and emerging diseases, but animals and vectors that carry these diseases, because the habitats are shifting, are becoming into contact with either more of their species or other species that they wouldn't necessarily have come into contact with as much. Um, for instance, we, for the USDA, um, we're on a rabies task force. We also track distemper outbreaks. Um, and so on Cape Cod, where I, we spend most of our time, it's a coastal city, um, we are seeing a lot of drivers of population shifts. A lot of it is from humans, uh, meaning development. Um, but we are also seeing some weather and climate related shifts as well, meaning loss of salt marsh habitat. Um, and unfortunately, uh, there is some, some new ponds and lakes and, and water bodies popping up where there, there weren't before. Um, so just to give you an example, uh, this was 2017 and 2018. These are just temper cases and uh, skunks, raccoons, uh, and foxes, I believe. Um, and you can see the dark purple is the first year. The light uh, blue is 2018. And you can see, just to give you an example, a shift out toward the Cape, right? And this is just two years. And each one of these represents three distemper cases. So these are hot spots. Um, and I'd show you this, not to tie it directly to climate change, but just give you an example of when you have populations that are forced into close habitat, what that can mean for a disease process. Um, and certainly, as a wildlife hospital, we are sort of on the front lines of this. We, we see all sorts of um, disease, disease outbreaks sort of manifest in different wildlife populations first. Um, and anecdotally, it does seem like it's becoming more frequent. We're constantly having to send out tests and um, communicate with outside agencies to try to keep a handle on this. Um, and the last one I'll say is, of course, we have weather dependent habitats. These are vernal pools on Cape Cod. Um, vernal pool, I'm sure you guys probably know what, what that is, but it's a breeding ground for amphibians. It's um, you know a seasonal pool, it's sort of a depression in the ground. Um, it will fill up spring, summer, and then dry up. It's a great place because there are no natural predators, meaning fish can't live year round in these habitats. Um, so amphibians can lay their eggs. A number of other animals um, use it as a resource as well. And so when you get these very extreme precipitation events and um, changes in um, you know, weather variability, we have these longer, warmer winters. We're also just starting to see some shifts in, in these pools as well, and, um, and certainly the amphibian populations that live there. And I should say, too, with all of the precipitation events, the really extreme ones we're seeing, the amount of runoff is going up as well, right? So you get a huge amount of rain. The ground gets saturated. It starts to sheet off, and it just carries with it whatever is there. Um, so I've been testing the salt in a, a vernal pond nearby for years. Um, in the last couple of years, especially this year with the huge amount of rain, I could see the road salt levels in this pond just you know, explode. Um, so that's a driving factor as well. And with that, I think that concludes our panel discussion. <laughs> Turn it back over to Eileen. Well, thank you to Sarah, to John, and to Zach. Very instructive and makes me hungry to hear, hear more from each of you. Um, are there questions that anyone has written down? Uh, well, you're going to have to speak to into the mic then here. So this is a question about coastal ecology. So I know that the uh, Cape Cod's a dividing line between the Mid-Atlantic Bight and then the Gulf of Maine. Are you guys projecting that this is going to shift? And if you are, kind of what's the time frame? Right. 
It's on. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So classically, uh, we considered north of the Cape to be what's called the Acadian ecoregion, and south of the Cape to be what's called the Virginian ecoregion. Um, and typically, uh, there were different uh, composition of species that lived south of the Cape versus north of the Cape. Um, as temperatures in the ocean and on the coast have been warming, we have been already seeing some uh, species shifts, particularly in more mobile species. Um, blue crabs have started to show up north of the Cape when they previously were never able <laughs> to survive. Um, and we've also seen um, gradual shifts of um, invasive species as well um, that previously would not have been able to survive north of the Cape. Um, that are now getting a foothold. I've read the term, uh, when I read the Los Angeles Times, which is a much better source of news than the Boston Globe about the environment, the, the term managed retreat, uh, which is used in connection with development. I've never seen that term used in Massachusetts. And what do you think it will take to get places like Marshfield or small areas in Duxbury and other places, just behind the dunes to get the houses out of there with managed retreat, or do you think that's possible? Um, yeah, so that's another good coastal question. Um, so it's definitely something that has been discussed in some of the planning departments on the South Shore. Um, certainly something that um, is if it, it's it's something that the public is maybe not quite ready for um, in a lot of cases, what's necessary for that to happen um, is a um, some sort of municipal structure that allows that process to go as easily as it can, and also the natural resources to allow that movement to occur. So. Um, in some cases, it's actually almost like uh, you're, you're choosing to abandon whatever these homes may be um, and go completely elsewhere. Um, another approach that's been taken in other places um, is something called rolling easements, where if you imagine sort of the, um, the, uh, your lot line, um, you know, that your lot would migrate back uh, with time, and so you know where your yard used to be here. Now this part is now considered your yard, um, but you, that other part of your property needs a place to go. So, um, if there is not a lot of open space, a good thing to say here, the you know land trust, um, those kinds of things can't happen. So um, that's one of the things that has really. Um, brought coastal open space preservation to the forefront um, of approaching um, these kinds of tactics as we move forward. I just wanted to add to what Sarah just said that I think there's, um, in, in conservation circles for a while, it seems as though there has been such a a focus, and it's a good focus, but a, such a focus on how do we stop climate change? How do we stop more pollution? How do you know? All those things are great topics to discuss and for all of us to take personal responsibility for. But this question is different, isn't it? This is saying climate change is going to happen. Sea levels are going to rise. What do we do about it? And I don't claim for a second to have a, a great answer for that question, but it's exactly the sort of question that, that land trusts, whether it's, it's places like here in Hingham or Mass Audubon, that's a big land trust at the state level, that's the question we ought to be asking, is how do we adapt to these future changes that we're gonna, gonna see? You know, maybe there's land that we potentially could save right along the coast right now, but it makes no sense to throw any effort there because in 50 years it's going to be underwater. So why bother? 
<laughs> why don't we just blow those off and concentrate on areas that maybe are in a different location? And those are very, very hard questions because we're having to make decisions that are going to go way beyond the lives of most of us in this room. We're not going to know what's going to happen in 50 years. Some people in this room will know what we've done in 50 years. That was yeah, well said. I, I, um, I just want to add, because we're so close to Situate. I'm sure you know every year you guys are so used to seeing those. Um, that's just one stretch of Situate which gets pounded by storms. Um, and that is an area where you hear the term manage retreat thrown around. I don't think there's a lot of public appetite for it at the moment. Um, but certainly there are rep something called repetitive loss structures. Um, and I think as Sarah said too, you know, when there's, when the, you have a municipal agency set up that can not only, um, you know, sort of inform people and try to do as, as much prevention as they can, but also maybe try to subsidize some of this managed retreat. Um, and, you know, by the time I know where I live, we pay a good amount of flood insurance. <laughs> um, you got to sort of manage your property line. Maybe there could be some tax subsidies for trying to, you know, move out of the, move out of the area rather than, than paying out the nose for for flood insurance, but. Um, John, this is this for you really, uh, well, for any of you, but uh, the idea, I, I'm just curious um, how migratory patterns for birds have been affected by climate change and any, any examples you might tell of that. I'm not sure I know of any changes in migratory patterns that have, have happened because of climate change, but, this is one of my soapboxes that I often <laughs> get on, is that we're thinking, and most of us in this room are thinking, oh gosh, what's gonna happen to the birds in my backyard and things like that? Well, you know, guess what? Probably 60% of the birds in your backyard most of the year are in Central or South America. And guess what? Climate change is happening in Central and South America too. So, you know, if we're going to be serious about trying to conserve things that we often sort of glibly refer to as our birds, you know, those wood thrushes and catbirds and black and white warblers and things like that, well, most of the year, they're not our birds at all. They're down in some country in Latin America, and down in Latin America, we need to be supporting land trusts and conservation areas that are built, you know, buying up big swaths of land that will allow climate change to kind of be absorbed down there, give birds the room to migrate up slopes, things like that, that otherwise our birds don't have a home down in that neck of the woods. So a uh, very interesting point you made, John, and, and it suggests to me that there could be campaigns for some of these things, and Mass Audubon may involve, be involved with that, but it's the kind of thing that lends itself to a community or a school groups or, you know, to adopt a species um, and think about all that ca they can learn from it in the process, uh, but, you know, partnering with a community far away and learning about that ecology. Are, are, are you aware of any programs like that? I am. I don't have those those web addresses off the top of my head, but I can leave a stack of my business cards here, and if you write me, I'll, t I'll send them to you. Great, and we can put that in our newsletter. Terrific. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you made reference to, to, in the beginning of your talk, about birds migrating further north. Does that mean that they're not going further south during the winter months? Or our winter months, I, I should say? It, I guess it, it would depend on the species. Um, some of those are just range expansions that push north. Um, and, and usually when I give this sort of talk, I show examples of, of two birds that are probably really familiar to everybody around here. One's northern cardinal. Anybody have cardinals in your backyard? You know what a cardinal looks like? Well, you know, if you turned the clock back about 100 years and you called up the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology up in Harvard and said, you know, guess what? I've got this bright red bird with a crest in my backyard and I think it's a cardinal. You know what their reaction would have been? They go, whoa, a cardinal? Oh my gosh, cardinals don't live in New England. They're just down in the Southeast. 
You've got a cardinal? That's a really rare bird. We'll come out and look at it right away. Well, you know, now cardinals are everyday events up here. They've moved north. And right now, there are no cardinals in the Gaspé Peninsula of Canada. But if I showed you one of those maps like I, I had up there for hermit thrushes, guess what? By 2050, the climate prediction would say that cardinals are going to continue that northward push. So those birds aren't really necessarily moving back and forth. Um, there might be, most of the birds are just as fixed on their wintering habitat requirements as they are in their breeding habitats. And so if you're a, a particular kind of thrush, like a Swainson's thrush or something that typically winters in the mountains of uh, Venezuela, you're not going to change and say, oh, this time I'm not going to go as far south because I've moved for further north, they're still probably going to do that, be my guess. That's a good question. I have one more point. Uh, in my uh, previous career, I was an emergency management director, and I always used to look, talking about northeast storms, coastal flooding, you'd always look at the tide chart, see when your high tide was. To the right of that chart was always a number of what the high tide was going to be. Typically, I'd look at 12.6. Bill Ridden, I'm sure, could speak to this as well. But I'd look at a 12.6 and I'd listen to what Harvey Leonard or National Weather was going to tell me what the what the flood was. If the if if the coastal flood if if the height if the tide, <laughs> excuse me. The coastal rise in water has gone up. Why haven't those tide charts been adjusted to suggest that? I mean, it's it's we don't have. If you look at a twelve six tide now, it's not a twelve six tide. It's a thirteen four tide because the ocean the ocean rise has gone up ten inches in the last fifty years, and it's expected to go up another ten inches in the next thirty. Those chats need to be changed. I agree. I agree. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's kind of been an interesting thing going on, uh, it seems, over the past few years where in addition to what, you know, the what NOAA predicts for the tide heights and um, like you're talking about, um, that the tides have also just kind of generally been higher um almost in addition to uh the sea level rise um and that, that it, it's not really something it's something that people who look at these tide levels every day you know you drive over a bridge and you know how high the tide usually gets and you're like wow you know the salt marsh has been covered up every single day at high tide um and i'm not sure kind of where that is coming from um I've been talking about this a lot with um, one of the other ecologists, one of the other watershed associations on the South Shore. Um, but that said, um, I think that they are looking to integrate um, those additions in um, progressively, from what I understand. Yeah. yeah. You guys all. Um You've probably heard of people talking about the 500-year flood or the 100-year flood, 500,000-year flood, right? And that's traditionally how we, we manage things. We said, okay, you know, the, the, um, we expect that in 500 years, this will be like the biggest storm we're going to get. Um, but that has shifted quickly, right? And you have to imagine, not only is that a problem for us and I'm sure emergency managers, but for all of those civil engineers who spent their whole careers designing these bridges and buildings and highways, you know, based on these metrics that are now shifting. Um, and because there's less predictability in the system and less predictability in the weather patterns, I, I believe it's getting harder to nail down what a 500-year flood actually is um, because we don't know the exact rate of climate change. We don't know the exact rate of sea level rise. We have a good idea of sort of the, you know, scenario one, two, three, and four, um, but it's hard to say with certainty. And I think it's something we're going to have to catch up with pretty quick or else it's, you know, it's going to be very expensive in a lot of different ways. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> Takes some time. Yeah. Um, is that I think as a, as a whole, um, it would be helpful if 
we all started thinking more about um, what those, you know, 100 year flood, 500 year flood um, mean in terms of percentiles and not so much time, right? Because like a 100 year flood is, or 100 year storm, you know, is the, the likelihood of that storm to occur once in 100 years. So it's like a 1% chance storm. But it's not like, oh, we just had our 100-year storm. We're <laughs> not going to have it for another 99. It's that every year you have that 1% chance. But as we've had climate change occurring, you're getting 1% you know, storms 10% of the time, something like that. So, I just want to bring this to a more local context. Uh, not last winter, but the winter before. I think we had three occasions where the water came up over Rockland Street. Now we had a, what they said was an 11 foot tide and we had a surge of about three feet, but I think Rockland Street's higher than that. So the like, question is, I don't know if anybody here knows, how much impact of the wind having coming up the Weir River instead of down the Weir River have on the amount of splash over we're gonna get? And I'll stop there. <laughs> That there were three times last year I could not get into my home. I live on Kilby Street, and Rockland Street was certainly impassable, um, which is something I had never experienced other than, um, I guess, three years ago there was one time. Um, but certainly I think there's a lot of issues at play. It certainly has a lot to do with the wind, meaning how much water it's, you know, it's pushing up in, in storm surge form, um, but also the drainage over there um, that plays you know, a big role as well. Um, and I, I heard they're doing some daylighting of culverts, I think, um, and some work over that way. So I'm hoping yeah, that will. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the Weir River Watershed Association is looking at some of those culverts and some, some that they think need to be repaired. Uh, gotcha. we were, Don Kitson and I were walking around with them one day. So uh, where that stands, I don't know. Gotcha. But the Kilby Street area, there's definitely some, some issues with how the water is captured and where it flows. Uh, as we're talking engineered solutions, we're talking about rebuilding seawalls, we're talking about letting uh, people continue to drive up and down what I call Tire Track Beach in Duxbury. How bad is this for the wildlife? What would be the best solution for mitigating t change, uh, climate change, uh, and have the best effect on birds and other wildlife? And I'll, uh, I'll admit that I don't know the answer, but I, uh, when I lived in, in uh, Plymouth, worked at Manomet Bird Observatory for a whole bunch of years and, and uh, worked during the turn nesting season almost daily out on Plymouth Beach or on Duxbury Beach. And so I know exactly what you're talking about with those tire tracks out there. And, and even then, probably 20 years ago now, there was you know, a huge debate over whether or not barrier beaches like that should should allow off-road vehicle use at all because it might, you know, influence the stability of the beach and the functioning of those barrier beaches as as protection for the mainland areas. And, and, uh, and I recognize there's all kinds of pros and cons to that, depending on which user group you're talking about, whether they're fishermen or, or families that don't want to lug stuff out on the beach by, by hand or whatever. But, you know, that, that will continue to be a, a real question. And I think that's a, a very local, very immediate sort of issue that um, I think the the state wildlife people look at that a lot when they they came up with modifications to how to enforce uh, piping plover protections and things on the beach over the la on all the beaches in Massachusetts um, over the last several years. Certainly, those arguments uh, were major parts of that consideration. Um, you know, it's it's a tough it's a tough call. You know, I think the current the current approach that the state and feds have kind of kind of gone to with with barrier beaches and piping plovers um, and lease turns um, is is one that sort of tries to identify really important portions of those beaches and protect those well and maybe not have quite so much 
uh, heavy-handed closure of other portions of the beach. So they're trying to find some sort of compromise solution. Or I'm not convinced I'm totally in favor of that, but at least I understand the arguments. Uh, just one, just one more comment from me. <clears throat> Excuse me. I, I I have to ask the question, Bill. If if you're going to build a barrier f from Winthrop to Hull, that water has to go somewhere. And uh, is that just going to push the problem out to Lynn and Duxbury and and, Kent and uh, you know Marshfield? Yeah, look, yeah. I'm not going to be try to answer for Senator Golden who after all, is the one who started the cleanup of Boston Harbor. So, I mean, he's, you, you, someone pointed out, hey, this is going to be tough to tie all these communities together. Well, if anyone can do it, it's someone with, with his kind of uh, um, drive, and, and he's done it, he's done it before. But, but the answer, in, in part, which is kind of intriguing, and, and Jim Watson, say, same for you, the, the notion of uh, a storm surge barrier and, and the effectiveness is, is in part that in preparation for a sandy coming, it take, yes, it takes a long time for a barrier to close, but you would close it at low tide so that then as, as the storm comes, and sure, the, 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 the barrier is going to be overtopped, but the amount of water, if you've got a low tide, if you start with a low tide in all of Boston Harbor, a lot of water can come over and still not inundate uh, the way it would if... You know, we're all remembering March 3rd, March 4th, last year, 2018. Those were the, those are the two storms in our town for the first time saw uh, the Iron Horse statue as an island. We'd never seen water all the way around that. And I've lived here since 1956. Ne I've never seen that. Uh, but that, that's why this is intriguing. What Senator Golden is trying to do is get an, a, a st study done that would say, okay, this idea is worthy of a Army Corps of Engineers major, major review. And if, if that can happen, then then perhaps, I mean, and, and he, he points to other jurisdictions as close as uh, New Bedford and as far away as down on the coast of Texas where they are, they are literally building one now. And it, and it will have been built in something like 15 years, not the 25 or 30 that they thought it was gonna take. So it's, it's, it's just an intriguing possibility. So we've been talking about uh, some of the things that might be done that involve a lot of study and a lot of people getting together. I'm just wondering if each of you could think of something to share with us that we could leave with that uh, something that we might observe uh, that would be worth reporting to someone um, or uh, something that we might do that could help the wildlife around our neighborhoods. Uh, you know, I, I'm intrigued to hear about road salt ending up in vernal pools and uh, hearing about changes in when squirrels come into the hospital. Uh, but obviously we're all out there observing things every day. Can we have a keener eye to notice things either to help protect a species or to report something that could be uh, you know, dangerous, you know, a new illness uh, coming up, anything like that? If each of you could just comment on that, that'd be great. Um, so, um, a project that I'm currently doing uh, down in the North and South Rivers um, is something that we're calling Salt Marsh Sentinels. Um, so, if any of you have a dock that goes over um, any sort of tidal wetland, um, probably salt marsh, but may even be a brackish tidal wetland. Um, what you can do is observe some of the shifts that I, um, that I mentioned. Um, so the way our project works um, is that um, in the first year that you do it, you go out and you mark where those divisions are between the high and the low marsh um, and the edge of the bank um, with a push pin in your dock. And then each year go out and see if that line has moved from where you put the push pin in. Um, and we're gonna be using that as a way to crowdsource um, this salt marsh migration data. So um, you could do that informally <laughs> if you have such a dock or if there's a public dock, you know, or uh, you know, town property, something like that. 
from your website that yeah. people could report the data? Um, well, not not probably for up here. I'm kind of working individually with the dock owners on the north and south. But uh. um, I'll take a little bit different tack to that question. Um, I think monitoring and documenting these changes is great. Uh, but I would like to encourage all of us, and I'm part of this as well, um, to do things that we think will improve the survivorship of critters that live in our own backyard. Because even though that doesn't really fix the problem of climate change, if we recognize that, that those you know, wood thrushes or purple finches or whatever is in our backyard are, are in a sense under stress as a result of all these climate change issues and do everything that's in our power to relieve some of the stressors that those species face, that's probably a good thing. And I'll, I'll just mention two or three things that, that I usually encourage audiences to think about with this. And this would potentially open up big cans of worms that I'm not interested in doing. <laughs> but if you kind of look at your yard as a sanctuary, you know, think what sorts of things you need to do to make your yard a really good sanctuary. And that can include things like putting tape across your windows to reduce the number of birds that fly in and kill themselves. It can include shying away from any sorts of, of pesticides that might be used in your gardens. And here's the politically incorrect one. It could include keeping your beloved cat indoors during the breeding season and times when birds are really vulnerable. I'll just stop with that. Can I, can I add uh, oh yeah. Action? Yeah, so um, since mine was more about passive observation, um, my action would be to please conserve water, especially in, especially in light of your new water source that you purchased. Um, conserve water, especially in the summer. Um, I've worked a lot with the town of Situate on their water conservation. Um, as soon as the uh, one day a week irrigation ban went into place, the town immediately started saving 300,000 gallons of water per day. Irrigation systems are a huge drain on our water systems. Um, so please out, reduce your outdoor watering as much as you can by turning your yard into a sanctuary that doesn't require watering. Um, yeah, well said. Mine is a very unpopular one, but builds on those two, is if you are willing to stop mowing your lawn, <laughs> um, or, <laughs> or, yeah, no, people almost throw things at me every time I bring this up, but if you have a lawn um, and you're even willing to, especially against your woodland edge habitat, let some of that grass grow, um, not only are you going to get to see all the um, wonderful species that are going to now inhabit because their food sources are there, um, it's also going to save water. It's also going to stop runoff and soak up a lot of that. It's going to shore up the soil. It's going to keep extra nitrogen and phosphorus if you're fertilizing things closer to home. Um, it also encourages drainage into our aquifers. There's just a ton of advantages to doing it. Um, and as more and more people do it, I hope that the public perception will shift to that being a beautiful yard rather than that perfectly, you know, one inch tall manicured green lawn. Um, so that's just one man's opinion. I don't. Well, that may be a great way to end things tonight on a note of action, steps that we can take individually or as neighborhoods. So uh, thank you all. Uh, it's been a really informative panel. Thank you.